Good morning, I'm Pastor Scott, and I'm with Hope of the Generations Church in Be In Health, and I want to thank you for joining us today to watch Overcoming PTSD with Dr. Henry Wright. You know, PTSD is a big deal, especially this time of year near the holidays, but for many, PTSD feels like a life sentence, replaying past traumas over and over again to the point that we don't feel safe. It's how it was with me. This isn't what God intended, at least here at Be In Health, we don't think so. Trauma does not have to define the rest of your life. This extensive teaching on overcoming PTSD uncovers the root issues behind this plague that has, that has begun destroying the lives of God's sons and daughters. Now this conference is just shy of five hours. I know, it's long, but just bear with us. And don't worry, we're gonna take some breaks in between, but I want you to set aside all and clear all your distractions. Every part of this conference is important and you know what? You're worth it to watch all of it. Other things can kind of wait a bit. Lastly, stick with me. Stick with us through the end of this conference. We've got some special offers that are going to be exclusively for those of you that are watching today. And God bless you and enjoy. Well, good day. I'd like to introduce the team. Welcome to our workshop on PTSD. We're going to conduct this as a panel looking at this subject as it has never been looked at before by anyone. However, it will be deeply substantiated by biblical and scientific and psychiatric investigation. I'm Dr. Henry Wright. I'm the senior pastor of Hope the Generations Church and the president of Be In Health. I have a master's degree in Christian ministry a doctorate in Christian therapeutic counseling with honors, and I head up this team. I am Pastor Anita Hill, and I have a background at, in a Bachelor of Science in Education, uh, Master's in Social Work, EEG Technician, and Nurse. And my name is Lavinda Summers, and I have a Master's degree in Christian counseling slash social work, and I'm so happy to be here. Well, team, let's go to work. All right. One of the things that I would like to do as we start our workshop is to go over the subject matter quickly. For those of you that are here as our audience and those that are watching this online streaming or those that are partaking of this later by... Um, video, we will define what PTSD is, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll get into that. We're also going to look at some statistics. It'll amaze you to find out this is not a vet issue alone, as many people think it is. Some of the causative action that produces it. We're going to look at some of your memory, your long-term memory, how that is, your short-term memory. We're going to take a look at pathways of thought, how thought travels, and the, even the biological components that are used to assimilate who you really are in deductive reasoning, cognition, and thought process. We'll open up another subject, understanding the spirit and the soul and the body. If you do not consider that we're a spirit, then we're in trouble, period. Because if you're not a spirit being, all you are is an animal, as zoologists say you are, which is incorrect. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. We're going to talk about the limbic system. System. We're going to talk about the mind-body connection. Could I insert something called the spirit-soul-body connection? We're going to take a look at some of the Jungian and Freudian concepts of psychotherapy. We'll take a look and define what is the conscious, what is the subconscious, what is the unconscious, and what is the collective unconscious. Is there, can thoughts come from some place other than your own mind? We're going to talk about that. We're going to also discuss some of the PTSD therapies that are being offered by government and by therapists and by psychiatry and psychologists 
and, uh, and even the Christianized versions and, uh, as to their approach. We will also begin to delve into something called our childhood. Does our childhood and the peace of it have anything to do with how we assimilate fear as adults? You'll find it big. How about in utero? How about inherited genetics? How about familial? How about thought that is inherited? That's a subject that will stir people up. Can your thoughts be inherited? We'll find out a lot about genetics, not just genetic mutation, but the new field of epigenetics. What is that? Oh, we'll talk about it. What is epigenetics? It's uh, really interesting. We're going to talk about birth experiences. We're going to talk about cortisol imprint. We're going to talk about uh, memory and trauma, stress door points, and then good news. We're going to have a ministry time. And at the end of our session, our workshop here over the next few hours, at the end of our day, we have team members that are part of our Being Health team that are going to assist me in groups. We're going to form you into groups of how many we can put in. And then they're going to do the ministry because we want to ask the Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to change some biology in you. We have discovered, even from science, that what makes, oh, I'm going to give you a word, what makes the amygdala enlarge, oh, let's tuck that one away. That's key to understanding PTSD, is what does the amygdala have to do with this phenomena? And what makes it enlarge? And is it possible for the amygdala to go back to size? Yes. If we can get the amygdala to go back to size, PTSD is a thing of the past. Now, while I'm just on this subject, both my team members, which are part of the research team here at uh, Be In Health, both of you, as we go through the day, may discuss your own journey briefly. Both of you could have been classified or were classified as having PTSD severely. You're pretty normal today. Thank you. like to think You're so. You're welcome. <laughs> I, too, am a survivor and have become a thriver. If we have a survival mentality, we will stay where we are. The kingdom of God does not teach you to be a survivalist. It teaches you to be a thriver. And there are ingredients that we'll talk about that will take you from the past, move you to the present, and move you into your journey of health and peace and freedom. Would that be significant to you? You know, much of this is taught in the uh, Be In Health program known as For My Life. And uh, there have been, I guess, close to 40,000 people have come through here over the years that have been through for my life. Uh, Lavinda, you were part of the, of the statistical analysis of the uh, Finnish study. And uh, if you, this little journal here, actually this little journal, if you guys have it in your overhead up there, if not, we'll just show them or leave it around later and you can look at it. This is um, a study that was just finished studying the outcome and you can jump in any time you want, Lavinda, because you were a part of statistical analysis. Isn't that a big word, statistical analysis? <laughs> well, statistics are important, I think. It was also important to uh, bring the people in and get them set up at computers and make sure that they took their the survey on time. Right. For uh, The first one was after they went to the before they came to the For My Life program, the second one was the week immediately following the For My Life program. The next survey was a month later. The next survey was four months later. And then we did a fifth survey 
either a year or two years after they had been through the For My Life program, the, the outcome was phenomenal. This outcome is this month, let's see here, look at this, October, well, this is November now, October 2015, the outcome of this study was published in the Journal of Religion and Health Worldwide. This study was done independently of us. It was done independently of anything that we would have an input in, and it was undergirded by Stellenbosch University in South Africa and Dr. Franz Cronier, who did the study and the outcome in the areas of how the For My Life program would have helped people within two categories, the category of depression and, the, and all the, the depression state you know, syndromes that are out there, and anxiety disorders. Do you want to talk about the results of this study? It's, well, it's unheard of in psychiatry. They were pretty good. <laughs> Like Dr. Wright said, the, the reason that we did this study is we had, we had doctors would come here that um, their, their patients would come back to them and they would be so much better or they'd be completely healed. And so these doctors, they wanted to know, well, what's up with that? And so the doctors would come, they would get healed. And then so uh, from what I understand, they were together one time in this Limpur, where Malaysia, one time they were just sitting around in Malaysia. You know, you do that, right? Well, we were we were in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, having a having a discussion with psychiatrists, doctors, and and uh, from the spiritual and the psychological and biological components of our right. lives. Right, and they said, wouldn't it be neat if we could actually see if we could measure the significance of this program scientifically? So they started work on that, and uh, a team was formed here at Being Health to help with that. Um, Jim Faulkner, wave, Mr. Jim. He he was responsible for getting the the computer stuff all together, and the scales that were used in this study were not things that we came up with. These were scales that the medical community and the scientific community use all the time, and so we put this the survey together. And like I said before, we we did it at in increments to find out the same survey was taken before, after, and months after to see if there was any change. The results were that there was significant scientific evidence, clinical evidence, that coming to the For My Life program made a significant positive impact on an individual's life, no matter what their demographic was, no matter if they were male or female, no, whether how old they were. Of course, you had to be 18 to be able to do it, but it was amazing. Nothing. Uh, the doctors that did this said that this is this is really phenomenal. This has never happened. So after that, the results that you're about to give us mm -hmm. after two years involves no recidivism. None. That word recidivism means you lost it. That means this wasn't a flash in a pan experience. Like Re you come to a cool program, and it's like, oh, I'm so excited. God loves me. I'm so good. everything is fine. Then you go home it's and you stuck. crash. It's stuck. It's stuck. What are the statistics in anxiety disorders? Well, what we did was, and that was that study, what we did is we took the raw, the raw data that we collected and we crunched those numbers. And in the area of major depression, which means, you know, major is major. And uh, in that area, we had 91% people who did not go back to their old ways. Now, I want you to track with me. 91% success in healing in the area of depression from people who just came through the For My Life program for one week. That is unheard of. Do you know what the national average is in success in depression? They're all therapies. One and a half percent. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Talk about anxiety. In the area of anxiety, uh, it was 83, between 80 and 85%. There, there were several scales that we did, and, but to average it out, it was about 83 to 85% success rate for these people that not only, not only did they, they change, but their character changed, the way they thought every day, long term. So that's, that's a really big deal. On the screen, for those of you watching, a copy of this uh, journal 
of religion and health. I understand it's available online, so you might go to their site and see if you can resurrect it from their system. And it is filled with material that most people don't understand, statistical graphs and all kinds of things. But that is a scientific part of this that has been so important to us because it was objective and it was thorough and it was undergirded by the scientific community who put it to the test. It's fantastic. They would call it was peer-reviewed. Well, PTSD is just one of those anxiety disorders. So why don't we plan on getting 91 or 85? Or how about 100% success? I read somewhere, I think it was the ancient writings, it's called the Bible, <laughs> that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. You know what the word says? This is the standard of everything we believe. Dearly beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your, where's your soul? Right here between your ears, even as your soul prospers. So God wants you to be happy, to be well, to be sane, that's a bonus, and to be healthy. That is the promise, and that is the objective of our journey, is it not? Also, back in our tables back here, you might want to pick up a uh, testimony that we printed uh, uh, back in 2015, actually recently, October, November, the story of John Aldridge out of Texas and his dramatic healing a few years ago of PTSD. John is totally well today. When I met him, he was a basket case. And he came to the Fort Mile program, and he disappeared on Friday. We couldn't find him. I had met him in a conference in, in Mesquite, Texas, and uh, I invited him to come because he was, he was, I don't know how many psychiatric drugs he was on, like maybe 20 or 30, and he was a, a, a chemical zombie. And uh, I invited him to come to for my life program, and he, and he came, and he disappeared. And we were looking for him over the weekend, he went home. And when we caught up with him, he said, why did you leave? You didn't finish the program. He said, I heard enough. I understand my problem. I understand what I need to do about it. Why listen to anything more? I'm going to go home and take ownership of my life. I think that's what God wants us to do, is rather than being stagnant victims of ourselves or others, we take ownership of our life. If you don't take ownership of your life, you're not Faithing. You're fearing. It's not dependent on whether or not you pray for me or you pray for me. It's dependent upon me and my relationship with the Father. Everybody is waiting. You know, I think people act think God's another drug that we can be zapped with or something and mis mysteriously get well. And even though God does heal people instantly, you know, I've learned that God wants us to change direction. And he wants to work with us. Praise the Lord. Um, I was praying about this conference, and when you were mentioning the soul and where is it located, uh, in Psalms 23, it just sort of jumped out at me. He leadeth me by still waters and restoreth my soul. A promise of God. Well, in this conference, we're going to give you some ideas how you can take ownership of your spirit man. You can take ownership of your soul, and when you do, your body will be happy. Your bodies are dysfunctional because the rest of you is dysfunctional. So we'd like to bring you into focus to be functional, spirit and soul, and then your bodies will rejoice and begin to heal. Wouldn't that be a wonderful benefit? You see, everybody today is ch chasing symptoms. You'll find out here we get into some of the PTSD therapies that are being offered. They're all chasing symptoms. Here at Being Health, we don't chase symptoms. We want to know what causes the symptoms. So we want to know the etiology. 
We want to know this pathway that produces the problem. Wouldn't it, rather than chasing symptoms, don't you think it'd be best to find out what causes the symptoms? And then get rid of what's causing the problem with the symptoms? I think that would be a benefit rather than going from healing to healing and therapy to therapy and drug to drug and this and that and this and that. Why don't we just deal with it? God wants to work with you. Well, let's get on into our workshop. The, um, what is PTSD? Well, it defines itself. Post-traumatic stress. So what this is would be an event that the body is responding to in the soul of the body that is after a stress event, trauma event, or stressor that produces something that is not good, and that's called a disorder. Now, one of the things I would like to say to you is that PTSD is not truly a disease. You have to be careful how they label you. Not every disorder is a disease. It could be known as a syndrome. A syndrome is something involving thought, is causing the body to come into imbalance of homeostasis or not function or go into dis-ease of function. If that dis-ease of function is not dealt with, it'll be a diagnosed disorder or syndrome. And the only time a disease is truly a disease in the way I look at things is there has to be something organically wrong with the body. And they're like, for example, you can go into, say, uh, hypothyroidism. It would be uh, a syndrome. Hyperthyroidism is a true disease because uh, the uh, immune system, you know, that's attacking the thyroid. So it, it all depends how, how the pathway is. But usually people associate uh, PTSD with war. I want to say something to you. Not everyone that goes to war gets PTSD. Not everybody that's exposed to a traumatic event gets PTSD. Jesus didn't get PTSD. He was exposed to more trauma than most people have ever thought about. Mutely, mutilated and brutally murdered for your sins. Yet on the cross, he wasn't into phobia. He was getting one, one guy saved while he was dying in pain, then he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't become one with even those who caused the problem. The Apostle Paul didn't have PTSD, yet he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by a snake, he was beaten with stripes three times, 40 less one, he was traumatized, he was, but he never developed PTSD. Now, I suppose this could be just an idea to pursue, but we've always made this thing a vet issue because it's, it's catching all the publicity. I want to make a statement to you. All of you have had stresses in your life that have traumatized you. All of you, to some degree, even today, still have some level of fear that you have not defeated. That affects you. That won't let you face certain issues. That causes you to avoid certain people that are stressors to you. And we'll talk about that. So I want to, want to say that as we, we speak through this, we want to give you the pathway that produces this syndrome. There are other syndromes. You know, we can get into panic attacks. We get into phobias. We can get into fixation of fear and fear personalities. We can get into a whole area of looking at all the anxiety disorders that you can name, and there are many of them. There's over eight or 9,000 different phobias that people deal with. We're not here to deal with that today. We'd be here forever because everybody has one. 
I said, everybody has one, don't we? We always have something that makes us afraid. So we want to look at this in this conference. We want to sidestep all the, how do I say this, all the, what secular science and psychiatry is trying to say. And we want to do an observation. We're not here to set ourselves as an authority, but we're here to set ourselves as an observer. And what we have observed in our study of the Bible, psychiatry, and, uh, and science. And all of us here, to some degree, have some credibility in these areas. So, I think the, the definition, uh, unless you guys want to add something to it, is exposure to some type of stressor. But that exposure to the stressor, and I want to give you a little bit, I want to run ahead a little bit. That exposure to the stressor may have been set up in you a long time ago, and then that stressor ignites something that you were actually trained to get. You have an enemy, folks. See, the problem with science, science only believes what it can see. So if you're chasing only that you can, what things you can see, then you're only going to see what you can see. When we get into certain types of disorders, even science is saying, there are things that we cannot see that are making these things happen. We don't know what we can't see, but we see what the results of what we can't see. We know it's there somewhere, but we can't put our finger on it because we can't see it. So we want to take you into the world of what you can't see today. We want to take you into something else that people that get PTSD, there is a villain, folks, that's assigned to you. That villain, let me see if I can find a scripture. I wrote a few scriptures down here that... Um, Okay, 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. I, I don't want to read the whole Bible to you, but um, it says, be, be sober, be vigilant. It doesn't, be, doesn't mean be a vigilante. That word doesn't mean that. Because, well, you've got to have some humor. This thing's too serious. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom you are to resist, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So you, there, is an, there is an enemy that is assigned to you and a kingdom to influence you. That influencing you is known as temptation. Can you see temptation? You can't see temptation, but you feel it, you hear it, you sense it. You know the source of temptation. You tempt yourself, right? God tempts you. Now that you know the Bible says God does not tempt man with evil, neither can he be tempted with it. But every man is drawn away of his own what? His own stuff. We all have our own stuff that draws us away. Now that stuff, if I were to tell you that 90%, maybe 80% of all disease is a planned event by the villain to capture mankind, and that most of us are puppets on a string in ignorance. That may offend some of you because you're afraid of what you cannot see. That's a phobia. Well, I want to, I thank God for God's word because God allows me to see what I cannot see. I got to give you a scripture. I think I wrote it down here somewhere. Here it is, Hebrews 4. I knew it was here somewhere. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder. A soul and spirit. So the word of God is going to separate how you think spiritually and psychologically. Have you ever had a conversation with yourself and disagreed with yourself? <laughs> Have you ever had conversations with people in your head? And they answered you? You guys are too easy. 
even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow. That's physiology, isn't it? So what does the Word of God have to do with physiology? Hmm, we'll find out. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Is a discerner of your own thoughts and the source of your thoughts. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What do you think is the creature that you can't see and I can't see that gives us thoughts, gives us feelings and emotions, tempts us with impressions that you can't see, I can't see, but the Word of God reveals that invisible being that can tempt you and speak to you and form you into a way of thinking. You see, this takes us into maturity, doesn't it? This conference ought to bring you to maturity, to a place to take ownership of your life and understand why and how come. Bring up the cortisol chart. It's the one, you know, there it is. I wanted to show you a quick picture. This is your immune system. And we use this chart in teaching people to understand where allergies come from and how people are susceptible to cancer. And you have an enemy that knows your biology better than Mayo Clinic. There is not a scientific investigation in the world that knows creation better than your enemy, the villain. He knows you from the inside out. He knows what God created, and he knows how to make it not function correctly. But he needs your help, and he needs your permission, and your ignorance to do it. What if we could pull that veil away today on PTSD? What if we expose that invisible kingdom, how it does it, when it began, and how, even down to how it manipulates your biology and your genetics? Would you be interested in that discussion today? So you're about to get an x-ray picture of things that science cannot see. Why I brought this chart up here is because this is coming out of a fear, anxiety, stress teaching out of biology. This is, comes from a medical textbook that doctors, I was a pre-med student, and this came out of one of my textbooks when I was a pre-med student. And I learned that fear could release cortisol that would destroy the immune system, and it had nothing to do with nutrition. When your immune system is compromised today, everybody wants to put you on supplements, herbs, $1,500 a month, not telling you that it's every bit of white corpuscles or T cells that are being developed because of all that expense. Fear is destroying every single one. This is a planned event. You can take that screen down. This is a planned event. And the reason I brought this chart up that I just showed you is to show you that fear undealt with can destroy your immune system. But what kind of fear? Now, I want to jump ahead in this conversation because we're going to move back and forth as a collage at what we're doing here. I'm going to make a suggestion to you that the types of fears that destroy the immune system are fears that develop in childhood, in, not initially necessarily, but let's talk about childhood. One of the things in our discussion with, with, with you, because you, you were healed of MCSCI, after years of devastation, and, and that is your testimony. And, and by the way, uh, you want to talk about your book? It's available in our bookstore online. Uh, talk just briefly how this teaching has impacted you understanding you know, I remember, I remember in my time in ministry with you when I told you that allergies were an illusion. You weren't allergic to anything, and you came with how many allergies? You're allergic to everything except one item. Beets. Beets. <laughs> they only gave me a severe sore throat. Yeah, the beets. The beet goes on for her. And so, 
and 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 she came to me with a mask on, allergic to everything. She would go to anaphylaxis, catatonic states, and she had, in fact, in the book, A More Excellent Way, which is available also in our, our resource lounge online, she is case history number one. And the 17 different diseases that this woman had are listed in this book, A More Excellent Way. And she has none of them today. I won't tell you your age. Go ahead. I'll be 80 next month. She'll Don't be 80 you. next month. <laughs> Come on now. She was... She was 55 when she came to me dying. 56. Close enough. <laughs> dying. No hope. And then she comes with all these allergies. And one of the things I did to you was hide your adrenaline syringes. Right. But he knew how to locate it if, if I needed it. Yes, I did. But I but, didn't know. But, I, but I, I would look at her and say, you're not allergic to anything. You're experiencing the byproduct of a compromised immune system from fear. And it's like I got off a spaceship from a different world because the whole medical industry and that industry had told her that she was allergic. She had allergies. There was no hope for her. And she had to stay away from all these things that causing all these, you know, allergies. Um, she's not watching anything today. I've seen as, as many as, you know, I see hundreds of allergies disappear from a person in 24 hours when God healed their broken heart. I've seen it time and time again. But, but this whole subject is, is that I remember the time that, uh, you know, I tell you how she gets so mad at me sometimes. I would, I would make you face your fears. Very definitely, and that that is one of the that is one of the uh, therapies that the uh, government is using today, uh, which is PE prolonged exposure therapy, which are may, making the people relive it and relive it and relive it. Uh, we'll get into some of the therapies in our teaching a little bit later this morning, and I won't get into it now, but um, I never forget the time in helping you face when things is that she was allergic to, to pesticides, and she was allergic. She couldn't even walk on grass without going catatonic when she came to us. And I remember one time in the ministry time, we were in the, <laughs> the Samaritan house, and I wanted to prove to her that I could create a catatonic state and an allergic reaction by the power of suggestion. Folks, you're that easy, too. If you're, if you're, unless you take ownership of your lives, everyone is susceptible to this level or can be trained to be more susceptible. And I remember walking over that window and I just casually, oh, the orchid man is here. I told them not to come to this place. That they come to spray the lawn. And instantly she went catatonic. Boing. I Learn. looked a little better than that. <laughs> <laughs> And she went into a, a reaction. And when she came out of it, which I knew she would, I wasn't concerned. I looked at her and I said, Miss Anita, there was no orkin man. I thought she was going to deck me. Did you? Did you deck him? <laughs> I said things to his team afterwards. Um, but Much I want later she said that. <laughs> I want to mention while you're saying about uh, catatonia, because I did spend a year where I wasn't talking or moving very much, and it's called catatonia, at least a stage of it. But um, it was interesting that we talk about fight or flight in trauma situations, but uh, Lavinda was mentioning freezing can be something that happens. You don't run, you don't fight, you just freeze on the spot. And um, a lot of my reactions were like that. And getting back to what you were saying about the whole area of some veterans don't have the PTSD and some do, and why would that be? I know in my own situation, there was trauma in the womb, and we will go into that later. 
um, that my mother had tuberculosis when I was in a womb, but no one knew it. She had also been told that um, she could die giving birth to another child because she had a heart condition. So there was a lot of fear that we know about generational stuff uh, coming on us. So I didn't get a good start right in the womb, and then the traumas continued, as you can read in this book, mm -hmm. but we won't go into all those Well, the now. book the book is out of many waters. Uh, this is a tremendous book of a person's life history, their journey from bondage to freedom. Uh, the proof of this testimony is talking to you in this conference. And uh, I think a testimony is incredible, don't you? What he has done for one, he'll do for another. Why? Because he's no respecter of persons. And uh, one of the things that, that uh, we will discuss with you in the PTSD, which is quite common to many of the, of the uh, syndromes, um, and, and by the way, why, why I wanted to go here, in reviewing this, I now consider, and I have never said this until we talked in, our, in our, our, our time together preparing for this conference, that MCSCI, multiple chemical sensitivity or environmental, environmental illness, is actually another form of PTSD. Uh, because the foundation is the same. And that foundation that was, is intrinsic to what I have found in thousands of case histories and helping people with MCSCI around the world, and, and it's been profound, the people that have been healed of this disorder, we have found that the trauma in childhood is quite severe. And, uh, and it involves, and I'm just going to go here a little early and we'll get back to it, go mixing back and back and forth. It involves one or more of five following life circumstances. Emotional abuse beginning in childhood, verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and here comes the fifth one, drivenness and performance. In order to meet the expectation of a demanding mother or father in order to receive love, no safe place. You may not realize this, but one of the psychiatric disorders, and I don't know who agrees with this or not agrees with it, I've, been, you know, I've got over 30 years of experience in helping people, so I think I, I could speak a little bit here. But in the case, case of paranoid schizophrenia, is not truly a disease. It really should be labeled a syndrome because it's a result of the oversecretion only of norepinephrine and dopamine. And what causes norepinephrine and dopamine to be oversecreted to produce this eventually uh, disorder of the mind uh, is, is uh, very spiritual and very psychological and uh, involves, involves performance and perfectionism in childhood in order to feel safe. I would say if I was to start early, in, if I'm going to tell you at the end of this conference, that all of our problems really is because we've not created safe places to live with each other, generationally. I just did a depression conference uh, a while back, and the depression conference was interesting, especially in bipolar. is a very strong indicator that it's inherited in family trees and follows family trees in which the father was not there, absent, or he was a problem as a husband and a father in loving and nurturing his wife and his children. That has spawned generations of depression and still is observable today. You're going to find in the PTS talk conference that we're doing here now that even science in doing case histories of PTSD, and we'll go back and read this stuff to you later. I'm just giving you a little overview also see childhood problems as the foundation for PTSD. At what levels? Guess what? Same as MCSEI. Exactly word for word. I was amazed when I read it. Emotional abuse. Verbal abuse. 
physical abuse, sexual abuse, drivenness and performance in order to meet the expectation of a parent in order to receive love. Many times the father's inability to create a safe atmosphere for the family is has been really observable in many disorders and diseases that I've seen over the years. What's really, and we're going to get to this chart sometime through the day, so I'm doing a little collage here. One of the things that we have found in our research from PTSD, if you have two fearful parents, traumatized fearful parents, the children <clears throat> are the number one candidate to get PTSD as adults themselves. Here's the next one. This was a shocker to me. The inability of a mother to nurture her child from the womb is, is a second major causative action that creates the foundation for PTSD worldwide. I would like to add uh, right on that is that um, I was born at home because of the blizzard and they didn't know how ill my mother was, and my father delivered me on the dining room table because the ambulance couldn't come through. But um, she became so drastically ill, they took her immediately to the hospital after I came out of the womb. And so immediately, there was no mother. And for the next seven years, there was only a mother in a sanitarium, and I'd wave at her through the window. But I knew there was something wrong with that, not knowing what a mother is supposed to do as an infant. But you can see how if that early nurture is not there, and we'll talk about this later, how um, the actual epigenetics, which we'll get into later, changes in um, what happens in the brain and how we react to that situation. Um, while you're doing this collage, I don't know if we have moved away from the definition yet, because the new definition in the DSM-5 um, points more directly to some of the things we see with MCSI. So could I yeah. read that? It's it away, not too long. But um, changes in PTSD criteria um, from DSM-4. Compared to DSM-4, the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic criteria for DSM-5 draws a clear line when detailing what constitutes a dramatic event. Sexual assault is specifically included, for example, as is a recurrent, uh, recurring exposure that could apply to police officers or first responders. Language stipulating an individual's response to the event, intense fear, helplessness, or horror, according to DSM-4, has been deleted because that criterion proved to have no utility in predicting the onset of PTSD which takes us back to the in utero or early childhood. Now, the DSM-5 pays more attention to the behavioral symptoms that accompany PTSD and proposes four distinct diagnostic clusters instead of three. And this is where I see the MCSI realities. They are described as re-experiencing, avoidance, negative cognition and mood, and arousal. And part of that is avoiding the whole issue. So then our journey begins in feeling safe. We just finished uh, this year a national tour called the Overcomers Tour in which we felt strongly that the foundation of everything, mankind and God combined, could be embraced in one scripture that Jesus quoted the Old Testament, mixed and matched, and he came out with this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your might, spirit, soul, body, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon this, 
all of the law and the prophets are founded. The foundation of the gospel, the foundation of all of creation, the foundation of all sanity, the foundation of all health, the foundation for mankind for all of eternity is embraced in being reconciled to the Godhead. The Father, the Word who is Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you being reconciled to yourself about yourself. You know how many people don't like themselves? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the horriblest of them all? I am. Ferris, not me. And being prepared to be reconciled to others. All 80% of all disease and disorders, and I have thousands and thousands of case histories, are rooted in separation at these three levels, from the Godhead, from yourself and others. The beginning of all healing and all disease prevention begins with being reconciled to the Godhead, being reconciled to yourself about yourself and being reconciled to others. The villain has set his image in mankind. And our ways are no longer God's ways. And if I was the enemy and I wanted to control the generations and interfere with God, I would control the families and the marriages. Because that's where the battleground is. I would make sure everyone hated everyone, was afraid of everyone, and I can produce premature death, I can produce heart attacks, I can produce strokes, I can produce all manner of disease, I can make everybody afraid of God themselves and others, and I'm going to laugh my head off because guess who's ignorant? No, the victims. You are not called to be victims. And if you were a victim, you don't have to stay one unless you want to live there. And if you want to live there in the past, it requires no faith to live in the past. So leave it behind. I have a new word this year, probably offends most people, but it's the most therapeutic word I've ever come up with in ministry about the past and about these things that aren't good for you. Flush it. Flush it. That's what you do most of the time. Why don't you do with things like this? You know, what I thought was funny about the new DSM-5 and what the, D, the DSM-4 before said that PTSD was mainly an anxiety disorder. Now they've changed it to a stress disorder. Stress, anxiety, <laughs> not much of a difference. But anyway, um, the DSM, DSM-5 will consider symptoms or disturbances that last under one month. They're acute. You know, like you have, you know, just like once. But if it lasts over one month, they're going to consider that chronic. So, you know, I have a, I have a verse I'd like to share with you. And it, it's, it's something that, that I, this is what I live by. Isaiah 26, 3, thou wilt keep him in peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because, if he, because he trusteth in me. Bye-bye, PTSD. Another interesting point in, um, before we close out the definition of PTSD is that the veterans would like them to address anything that happens to them in the service as um, PTSD as a physical disorder rather than an emotional disorder that it is now looked at um, by the general public because they feel that as men, basically, they don't want to be labeled with the emotional, so call it physical, and then they would have more acceptance, they think, in the community that they're not just, you know, depressed or something of that effect. Well, certainly, knowing what is causing us to manifest is important. It happens in the physical dimension, but if we make it just physical, we're going to have to remove all the scientific investigation behind PTSD, and it's not just a vet issue. A very small percentage of people that have PTSD are vets, and a very smaller percentage of people that are, we have gone to war also have PTSD. I have to leave this with you. The people that get PTSD 
were prepared to have it in a lifetime from childhood and before. We're going to prove that here today. We're going to expose it today as a diabolical plan to control mankind in his ignorance. The information is clear in science. The investigation is clear. Uh, we're just casually looking at what science and psychiatry has been looking at. And what we'll do when we're going to take a break here in just a moment is when we come back, we're going to talk about the pathways from the spirit world. We're going to talk about how that kingdom influences us. We're going to delve into the subconscious. We want to talk about what, what did Carl Jung mean when he said, really, it has to do with things that are manifesting from the collective unconscious. And out of the collective unconscious are the archetypes and dark shadows of our ancestral darkness. That's Jungian psychotherapy. And Carl Jung saw that there was something invisible that was intelligent that was causing mankind to be formed in its image. And of course, through therapy and uh, all that, he would attempt to, through dialogue, have a person defeat that simply by exchange of concepts. Well, I have to tell you something. The easiest way to get rid of fear is remove it. We're going to talk about fear being a spirit when we come back. Through being how, we found out what do we have to do to be able to live successfully on earth. Mm. And that's made all the difference in the world. We're not victims. We're not uh, being put down anymore. We're being able to rise up and be the man and woman of God that he created us to be. We found it on YouTube and we started watching. Well, go ahead. <laughs> well, when we found Being Health on YouTube, we started watching. And at the time, m mostly what we were watching were the many teachings that are on the YouTube channel for Being Health. And one day I looked over at my husband. It was during the summertime, which is pretty hot in Texas. So we were wearing short sleeves. And I looked over at my husband sitting in his easy chair and his arms, which were covered with about a quarter of an inch thick of psoriasis from his all the way elbow up. all the way up. I just, just saw it starting to disappear. And I looked over at him and I said, honey, look, the psoriasis on your arms is starting to disappear. And mm. and now you can see it's, it's a little speck left basically on. gone and it was on all the way up and down here. Both elbows. I'd scratch it at night. My sheets would I had on my uh, calf muscle down here and I'd scratch in my sleep and the sheets would be all bloody in the morning. And it's all gone. And no medication. And no. what was the next thing? Uh, no lotions, nothing. Just from receiving the truth and my husband realizing that it was an autoimmune disease that was based on him not loving himself and he started loving himself and it started disappearing praise god mm -hmm. and then we we saw where dr wright was being interviewed by somebody about ptsd and that is something that my husband had been diagnosed with about 30 years prior to that and uh so we decided we would watch that teaching and see what that was all about and and on on that oh, yeah, session, good. Um, Dr. Wright was saying something about how this woman who'd been in the military and had PTSD just just laid her hand on her brain area where the amygdala is and how she just started speaking. And he said, in fact, you know, you could just pray like, like she prayed. And he started saying the words. Hey, he said, that the woman "There's probably a said. lot of people out there with PTSD, and you can just join in." So I did. And I put my hand on my amygdala, and I commanded it to go back to normal size. I uh, repented for making fear my faith instead of God's faith. God's faith, my faith. He went to bed that night. He also had sleep apnea and had a breathing machine and 
I walked through the bedroom, saw him laying in bed without his mask on, and I tapped him on the foot and I said, honey, you, you didn't put your mask on. And he obediently woke up and put his mask on and I found out the next morning that two or three o'clock in the morning, he woke up and had to just jerk it off because all the benefits that he had received when he started using it years earlier were now completely reversed. Okay. Instead of it solving nightmares, he was having yeah. nightmares. Instead of it helping him breathe, he was he couldn't get his breath. Go ahead. So it just uh, to us verified that I had had indeed been healed of the PTSD. And then uh, what was next? <laughs> wow, it's been so many things. So um, then he has been on uh, medication for diabetes since 2013 or early 2014 and uh numbers kept getting worse they tried to they wanted to put me on a statin for the last couple years and i kept resisting that saying well i'll exercise more i'll eat better i'll exercise more i'll eat better and the numbers kept creeping up every time i go and all of this be was before we found out about being health yeah. which was only about six, seven months ago. Yeah. And uh, about, oh, we forgot about your anxiety disorder. <laughs> There's so many yeah, things. Yeah, so that Lord helped me get off clonazepam, which I'd been on for 20 years. And the, my, so back to the diabetes. Uh. Yeah, then he <laughs> went to the doctor and they ran all his blood and they told him he, he didn't need the diabetic yeah, medication the anymore. The attending physician came in and said, I don't know what they've been telling you, but you don't need to be on any medication. You're fine. <laughs> so, so, and I'd made no dietary changes. I didn't He's do anything extra. Or I just started loving on myself and applying some of the some of the principles that we learned. Um, sell everything and come. <laughs> Get here yesterday, and. You had a good point about that. Well, yeah. all, <clears throat> all these things Everything that we've shared we've described, that we yeah. have definitely already received healing from, uh, which has ha been happening over the last six and a half, seven months since we found Being Health on YouTube. Um, we got all this from just having bits and pieces of the For My Life program. And so we reasoned that if we got all this just from having bits and pieces, and we still have other things that we need to go and get the full, full treatment, the full program, so that we could continue on our journey, you know, stronger, better, healthier, and, and even longer, you know, because of the understanding that we, we're not gonna have premature death in our lives. Just the thing that has impressed me so much and it was hard for me to get here. I had a lot of resistance, a lot. I mean, I just felt like, you know, we just keep watching the bits and pieces on YouTube. And, you know, I used the term in God's perfect time, which was an excuse. And Penny's like, no, we need to go now. Now's the perfect time. So when I submitted to that and made the decision, you know, God's made a way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but just the systematic way that, it, it, that I've been relieved of all this stuff that I've been carrying for 61 years that I wasn't even aware of, that just has been piled up, you know, decade by decade, experience by experience. I feel like I'm 30 pounds lighter, literally. And as and, you say that, it reminds me uh, when we prayed, when he prayed, when we learned about the PTSD, what we realized was that this had been a burden on him from the moment he was born because he was born with, I think that the, the, the situation is called per, peris, peristenosis or something, I forget, I, I usually know what the name of the word is, but I can't think of it right now, but where the valve that opens to let his food into his stomach was completely uh, sealed Seal. up. A so he over there. wasn't getting any nutrition and nobody picked up on this until he was about six weeks old and nearly dead. And it was, that's where the trauma started. 
that was that, that planned event that Satan had because of generational iniquities that we've learned about through B and Hell that con continued, began and then continued one trauma after another after another for 30, 40 years in his life before, you know, we finally saw that enemy and was able to overcome it through the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. His father is a, is a pastor and a missionary and a Bible college professor. And he said, you know, when I got saved, I feel like I got part of the story. And uh, I said, yeah, when we got saved, we got, this, we got this part of the story. What do we have to do to get to heaven? Through being health, we found out what do we have to do to be able to live successfully on earth. Mm. And that's made all the difference in the world. We're not victims. We're not uh, being put down anymore. We're being able to rise up and be the man and woman of God that he created us to be. And we're very grateful for that. Thank you, being now. Yes. Amen. Do you know how many people that I have held that would just weep? And I would just weep with them mm -hmm. until we were both spent. Mm -hmm. Neither one of us were the same person ever again. Amen. I never knew all of this stuff. So I've got a new life and I got a new relationship with my father. And that fills that, that emptiness inside of me that I could never, I was looking for things to fill it and could never find it. I got healed from scoliosis and I've had it since I was like 12. Van Health healed me from ADD. I've been able to open up and make more friends than I had before. Well, For My Life is one week of looking at your life and looking at your thoughts and looking at what is in your background, what's in your family history, and looking at why you've got problems in your life or why you've had illnesses. So it actually is a way of thinking about disease from a, a biblical or a spiritual perspective. And that allows you then to think, is your life actually in line with the Bible or is it actually totally out of line with what the Bible teaches? It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful cabin experience, you know, <laughs> and you get to hang out with really cool people. It's really neat to meet people from all over the U.S. and even from other countries here. The staff, the staff is at amazing. At Hell is really, the oh my staff goodness, is amazing. you know, it started from on the phone, you know, mm -hmm. very engaging people, mm -hmm. and then to come and meet them in person and the way, you know, they take their time. They talk do. with you, you know, and um, give you their shoulder if you need to cry questions. on your shoulder. Yes. These people are so caring. There's no judgment. I have experienced love, compassion, acceptance of Christ through each and every one. All my life is life changing. Life changing. It's life changing. It's a change that other people can see. Take time out for your life. Don't miss the opportunity. Uh-oh, 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 back to back for my life. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this working panel for you is not designed to be definitive, but simply as observers that we're sharing with you what we have observed in scripture and in psychiatry and science. We did not come up with our own conclusions on our own. 
but we do have the ability to understand spirit soul body connection which is a a really interesting undeveloped field in uh, Christianity and in science in the field of pneumopsychosomatology you got that didn't you pneumopsychosomatology the study of spirit soul and body the effects of thought spiritually and psychologically on the somatic expression of biology. Did you get that? You'll find that this uh, study of, of uh, spirit soul body will be quite important in our understanding. We also would put a disclaimer that we're not into diagnosis. So if you come and say, do I have PTSD? I have the foggiest idea. And if you go to a psychiatrist, he will use the DSM-5, which is what Pastor Anita and I referred to before the break. It's the manual that they diagnose you from. And they have, uh, if, you, if you experience two out of three of these things, then you've got it. So psychiatry doesn't do much better. We've used the term DSM-4, DSM-5 is the, is the printed material from the psychiatric industry of uh, diagnosis. Uh, protocols of therapy, drugs to be used, and all the rest of it that they go by as the uh, way they approach. <clears throat> um, like, for example, in, in paranoid schizophrenia, they're going to either incarcerate you or put you on lithium or drug you. Uh, our success with God working with us in paranoid schizophrenia here and being health is excellent. And by the way, we use no drugs or external things to bring health to people. I want to say that we have nothing to sell other than, what are we going to sell? We're, we're certain we have resources, but it's all spiritual, intellectual, <clears throat> that you have to mix your faith with, and it's based on scripture, uh, or I call the ancient writings. And uh, everybody is into ancient writings these days. You say, I'm going to quote from the Bible, they go to sleep. So I'm going to bring to you some things from the ancient writings, and everybody's awake. And so a lot of it is what we call continuing education. And so we want to make sure that we do not come across here as someone that is uh, trying to act too professional. Or, but we would like to say that what we're sharing today probably is a portal for investigation in the future by everyone about this subject, because it has to be understood. Um, and so much for that. I just wanted to make sure that we understood ourselves in that area. <clears throat> um, I want to take you quickly and talk about short-term memory versus long-term memory. And uh, in short-term memory and long-term memory, um, I was trying to find a little note I made to myself. Today, all of you are experiencing me and us, and you're taking snapshots with your eyes and your ears. We will not teach you with touch, taste, and smell. So are you using two of your, of your five physical senses, which is sight and sound? And you're perceiving us. Um, could we bring up the um, spirit soul body chart because I want to take you on a journey. I want to defeat these problems. Would you like to defeat it? How would you like to prevent it? And how would you like to be healed from it? Everyone has a certain amount of phobic characteristics to their life. We have certain people that we avoid out of fear, that we don't like, they don't like us. So that's a phobic relationship, is it not? That has a result. And you get around people that make you afraid, you'll sweat, you'll... Your brain will freeze, you'll, you won't be able to talk right, and you won't know what to say, and then, then you get stage fright, and you get, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, your body's responding to something invisible, is it not? Spirit, soul, body chart, please. Uh, I need it up immediately, if not sooner. Uh, <laughs> Go back to anytime you want. I just wanted to, let me, let me take a look at it real quick. Do you, why, don't, why don't you just talk about it? Oh, the statistics. Thank you. Could, could we hold there just a moment? 
Uh, we got so carried away having fun talking about everything. Uh, I don't find the chart that is the is the one that I want. It's probably in it's probably in mine. Could we? We're formatting here. Could I give this back to you and I'll take the AA? It's, you know, it's hard to keep up with this much material. Would you like to try it? It's like, man, I don't multitask very well at all. Do you? That's why he has us. That's why you have yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, PT, PTSD statistics. I thought uh, um, this would be um, 70% of adults in the U.S. have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives. That's about 223 million people have experienced a stress event, a traumatic event. Not just a stress event, but a traumatic event. Of the 70%, 20% of these people go on to develop PTSD as a disorder. And if you did the numbers, that would be approximately 40 million Americans struggle and have been diagnosed with PTSD. And, uh, and also, an estimated one out of every nine women of this women group, uh, uh, one out of every nine women develop PTSD. That's a pretty high percentage, making them uh, in, in the uh, higher level of versus men. The reason that a female is found more often in some of these diseases uh, is, is very important to you to hear because there are certain disorders, like fibromyalgia, for example, is a 99% female disorder. A uh, higher percentage of, pe of females get hypothyroidism uh, of the thyroid. Um, we have found that in MCSCI that 90% of the people that get multiple chemical sensitivity are female. There's a higher percentage of females that get PTSD. And the reason for that uh, is you females were never, you were designed to be nurtured and loved. And us men were designed to give you the foundation of safety for you and your children. If a female has not the foundation of safety and feeling safe with a husband or a father, she will develop disease. I said she will develop disorders. If a woman comes to me with hypothyroidism, the first thing I ask her is this, are you married? If she says yes, I said, does your husband show you his love? Does he nurture you? I usually don't get an answer. I get tears. If I have a woman that's married with hypothyroidism, the first person that God can use to heal his wife is her husband, and he won't like me when I tell him that. So the enemy has done a, I would say a wonderful job, actually a horrible job, of changing us men from proper coverings, generationally, as proper safe husbands, proper safe fathers, and proper safe men, period. And we're carriers of the iniquity of the failure of our generations. Generation after generation, here we are. And so, and so that would be very important if we're going to look at the healing of PTSD. There must be a place that you f begin to feel safe. Well, first of all, you can feel safe with God. Well, that's easy for me to say, isn't it? Many people are afraid of God. And they don't like themselves, and they don't think he likes them either. And, uh, and so there's, a, there's this whole persona of confusion, and, and, uh, and this whole thing is just like, a, oh, man, just a bunch of pieces floating around and all confused. So anyway, so much for that conversation. Um, did I finish that part? Getting back to short-term memory. Could I interrupt just Sure, go right second. ahead. Yes. Um, to mention that um, children at risk, about the 3 through 100% will get... 
STD. Three to 100 at-risk children will get a diagnosis. Um, in the article, it just says um, three to 100 percent. I don't know why that low number. Well, between three and 100 percent. Take your pick. <laughs> Somebody's at risk. <laughs> at risk means um, left home alone a lot. It means parents, one parent child, one parent household. It means uh, parents might have a psychiatric diagnosis. It, it, they're at risk because they're not being taken care of and nurtured. And well, the, the risk involves the, the things that we saw, verbal abuse. Right, verbal abuse. You know, emotional abuse, mm -hmm. physical abuse, sexual abuse. And then receiving love is how well you did something. I mean, getting, getting, a, uh, and many children growing up, getting a B or a C was judgment day. You had to get A's or you were no good. So no wonder we have these performance disorders today. And, and, and besides, who you are is not what you do anyway. God never intended every human be a white collar. Get over it. It's also interesting, excuse me, that Three to six percent of at-risk adolescents get it. That seems low to me. That pretty seems low uh, because everyone that has unresolved um, trauma in a lifetime uh, will end up with a persona of fear. And that persona of fear can be quite phobic, and uh, and so that that goes across like a. Uh, well, it would be hard to define that unless you got into personal case histories. Mm -hmm. And in personal case histories, then we can see the journey of a person. Uh, we like case histories, and we like diagnosis by professionals. And, and I must say this, is that, is that God and the Bible are not against science. I'm, I quoted you out of Hebrews, didn't I? The Word of God is able to separate the spirit from the soul and the joint from the marrow, did I not? That joint and marrow, that's your immune system and so on. In fact, I'm indebted to science to see what I cannot see with my two eyes. I may not be in agreement with the conclusion of science because the conclusion of science is still falling what it can see. But I will tell you that I am indebted. Again, I will say this. I'm not against science as a, a study. Because the study of science is simply the study of what God created. And I'm interested in knowing about what God created. And if we didn't, couldn't look into what science had seen at the level that we see here in research, we wouldn't be able to bring you these conclusions. And then the many years of case histories and studies by others that we didn't have to spend the billions of dollars doing. We are partakers of that long journey of work and investigation, but now we understand it spiritually. We understand it spirit, soul, and body, and we understand the source of thoughts where most of science only blames the person for their thoughts, or they try to micromanage their thoughts, or they get them into, into uh, psychiatric counseling and, uh, to understand their thoughts. It may be that you need to know that your thought may not be yours originally to begin with, and that's our discussion this morning, a little later. Well, with that, can I move ahead? Yeah. All right, good. Jump anytime you want. Short-term memory is the processing of what you, you see. On this chart up here, um, you will find that you are a spirit God is the father of all spirits. Is that what the word says? And so if you're born again, God is your father. If you're not born again, God is your father. You're just separated from him. That's why you need to be born again to be reconciled to your true father, the father of all spirits. What's wrong with that? So you're a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a mobile home. And some of you have thatched roofs, some of you have no roofs at all. Some of you are just naturally gorgeous, and the rest of you are held together by polyplastic and Mary Kay. But... <laughs> Excuse well, me? Well, come on now. <laughs> come on now. Us guys don't have that benefit. We're stuck with whatever. So, but that's... I use Clinique. <laughs> I use the Word of God.
You are a spirit. <laughs> now, if you if you're a neurologist, on the study of neurology, you'll find what I'm about to share is very accurate. That you have two brain waves that carry information to you from the outside to the inside. Now, in the study of PTSD, these pathways are both ways. The trauma event is external, but the reinforcement of the trauma event is internal. And your ability to remember things has a little help because a spirit of fear will help you remember. In fact, one of the, one of the things that we found in some of the research of, of PTSD that really got my attention, it, says, it said this, a person that's suffering the recall, the thoughts just bubble up out of nowhere. They use that word, bubble up. They just bubble up. The person wasn't thinking about it. They didn't want to think about it, but it just bubbled up. We want to talk about where's the bubbling coming from. And so that the person that is struggling with these bubbling up thoughts of fear, that you don't have to take ownership of that thought. Your mind is renewed. This part right here is renewed by the washing of the water of the word. God has not given you the spirit of fear. God has... So the, this is King James. The Bible defines fear as a spirit, intelligent being by its fallen nature. God has not given you the spirit of fear. It doesn't say A, it says the, but power, love, and a sound mind. If you have fear, you don't have any power to overcome. If you have power, if you have fear, you usually are suffering from a broken relationship with someone somewhere. How do I know that? 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Now, if we can prove from science that behind PTSD, that there are people that did not experience proper love in childhood, MCSEI, same thing, our relationships that later on develop these disorders, then we could say that that person has fear because they did not experience love. And every person here has had a breach somewhere with someone at some time. And those memories still come back and talk to you. And not only those memories come back and talk to you, they, some of you will keep your distance from people because you're afraid of being hurt in the future. So you really are phobic because you're avoiding your stressor. But now you're projecting that stressor on everybody around you who wants to love you, but you won't let them love you because you have to keep them at a distance. They might hurt you. You're too easy. You're so easy to be had at this level. You isolate. I need you. Come out of your zoo hibernation. Stop acting like an animal at the zoo that just needs to be looked at from a distance. Come on out. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. This is 1 John 4, 18. Four parts. Fear has torment. There you have it. He that fears is not made perfect in love. That means if you have this kind of fear, you're unable to give and receive love yourself without fear. Now, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I was trying to find a scripture here, and I've lost it. And I'm probably going to have to go look it up. I thought, sure, I wrote it down. But you know how it is these days when you write stuff down, can't find it. But I'll take you to Job. I won't take time to read it. You can go find it for yourself. I remember enough of it to paraphrase it. 
The Bible says what Job feared greatly came upon him. One of the stories in Job, and you can find it, and you can find out. I'd be happy to read it. I got a Bible over here. I'm, I'm sure I'd written this thing down. There was a spirit that manifest around Job. He could not see it, but it was like it was there, but he couldn't see it, but it spoke to him. And when this fear, when this spirit of fear manifest, Job said the hair on his arms stood straight up in the air. You ever had that happen when you, you ever seen your hair jump up in the air and salute? And that spirit spoke to Job and said, Job, you're just like everybody else. You're going to die, boy. Well, I paraphrase it. You're going to die, boy. To put what? Fear of death in Job. Fear of dying. And this thing manifests to, inf it's right in your Bible, it manifests to influence him in his thinking. Now, I'm not sure that fear is always going to manifest as a make your hair jump up and, and make you see the kind of an apparition and all that stuff. And, but fear will speak to you as if, it your own, if it's your own personality. It comes in the first person. It comes with feelings and thoughts and emotions. And we have this whole picture of this kingdom that can speak to you. Everything that you perceive externally, you process through beta brain waves. You're doing it right now. It's being recorded eventually in the cerebral cortex. But it could be that the trauma event is external, but the thoughts of it are internal. That's why you can't make this thing physical alone. The manifestation is physical, but the thoughts aren't physical because your body doesn't think. Your soul does and your spirit does. But there are things that can speak to your spirit that influence your soul. That's temptation. And things that speak to your spirit, go to that next chart. Things that speak to your spirit could be God, the Holy Spirit. It could be your own spirit talking to you. That's why you have a thought here, and deep inside, there's, there's a disagreement. How many of you have disagreed with yourself? You had a thought here, and deep in here, say, so better not do that, better not say that. So your spirit man can think independently of your soul. And your soul can think independently of your spirit, but your spirit and your soul can become one in thought. In conclusion, fear wants you to become one with itself, spiritually and psychologically, that it can control your physiology. Now you're going to see how the enemy can afflict your limbic system here today right down to the hypothalamus and the amygdala and the thalamus gland and all those weird-looking names. Every one of these little, little glands that I have just discussed are critical to you processing your peace or lack of it. And it is a center for emotions. The enemy can actually bypass your mind and control your physiology as if you didn't exist. You just shut down. And you're a victim of checking out. They call it disassociation. You disassociate. Why? To avoid the thought. But the thought is still there. And the thought is still affecting your biology. Well, you've checked out. You, you don't need to check out. You need to check in. It's called the betrayal trauma theory. Go ahead, talk about it. And it proposes that in cases of childhood abuse, dissociative amnesia is an adaptive response and that victims may need to remain unaware of the trauma, not to reduce suffering, but rather to promote survival. And what has happened is the enemy has given this child or whoever something other than what God had planned. And so instead of relying on God, you're relying on checking out. 
So out of sight, out of mind is not a spiritual principle. You know what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5? You're to hold every thought captive. That's not checking out, is it? That's not disassociation, is it? God wants you to face every thought and not be afraid of it. You're to hold every thought captive, casting down every imagination. That'd be emotion, feeling, every high and lofty thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And, what is, and where can you find the knowledge of God? The Word. In your Bible, in the Word. And can I say, it, it's a lie from the enemy that, this, that it's scary to do that because this is fun. This is fun being present. It's fun facing fears. I mean, after a while, it's like, Bring it on because I want to face it, because I want because I want the victory that comes after it. It's fine. Don't be afraid. It's a lie. Unless you don't want to be an overcomer. Do you want to survive or do you want to thrive? Then you're gonna to have to take ownership of your life, spirit, soul, and body. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly. First Thessalonians 5:23. May the God of peace sanctify you holy. That word holy there is an H-O-L-Y in the King James. It's W-H-O-L-L-Y. That you be preserved blameless in spirit, soul, and body until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you to be whole. But you have to understand the three parts of you that need attention. And stop being ruled by your bodies. Your bodies are already being ruled by the enemy. Why don't you rule your bodies in faith and in truth? Because what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 6, then after you've held every thought captive, it says having any readiness to revenge all disobedience after your obedience is fulfilled. That means you're going to deal with everything that's not of God in thought from the enemy. You're going to come and bring that into captivity that you can become obedient to the word of God there's where the Spirit of God is. There's where your Father is. There's where it works. If you want to win this thing by yourself with mind over matter, you will lose. Now, how would you like to have God join you against your enemy? How would you like to have God rebuke the devourer for your sake? How would you like to see battles won beyond your own minds that you were free and didn't even know how you got free, but it was certainly nice to experience the benefits? Come on now, folks. Let's go for the home run. Quit hanging around first base. Now, not only can your spirit man speak to you, but evil spirits can talk to you spirit to spirit. Somebody said, well, I'm a born again. Well, I'm proud of you. Congratulations. Say, well, I'm born again, and evil spirits can't speak to my spirit. If you can prove that to me, I'll, I'd be interested. It's, it's a catechism in Christianity. But I'll give you a little bit of science. Your soul only perceives things externally through beta or internally th from your spirit to your soul through theta. There are no other brain waves that carry thought that exist in creation at this level. The enemy cannot speak directly to your soul. God doesn't speak directly to your soul. Then how can the enemy speak directly to your soul? Does the Holy Spirit speak to you from within or from without? If you didn't, if you didn't have theta brainwave, then the only way that you could experience the Holy Spirit, he would have to materialize in the physical dimension, and you would perceive him through a beta brainwave. If you didn't have theta brainwave, the only way that that uh, the enemy of the evil spirits could tempt you to try to influence you, where they had to be, they had to materialize in the physical dimension. But they don't have physical bodies, and neither does God. So they're going to deal with you at the level of your creation, spirit to spirit. There are no pathways to the soul other than theta and beta. I challenge anyone to overthrow this. It is impossible. You're going to have to bring ignorance, and you're going to have to bring denominational catechism and dogma, and it will not stand the test of the study of neurology.
not going to happen. So let's put away the argument and let's say, okay, the thoughts coming to me didn't come from the outside. They didn't originate in my poor head. What's left? Well, it has to come from within. Can I, can I read a scripture? And I think this is very important that you understand this. Um, it's Mark chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, uh, in part. And Jesus is the author. <clears throat> I want you to listen carefully because you're not going to defeat fear unless you hear this. Jesus said, do you not perceive that whatsoever things from without enters into the man, it cannot defile him, because it enters not into his heart, but into the belly, and goes out Charmin land. That's what it says in the book of Henry. Right, Mr. Whipple? <laughs> Flush it. Come on, this is this, you have to be, have a little humor here. You know, you're not going to defeat fear unless you've got a little happiness. And Jesus said, that which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. Listen carefully. For from within, out of the heart of men, ladies too, proceed evil thoughts. So where do evil thoughts come from? From without or from within? Out of the soul or out of the heart? Out of the soul or out of the heart? The heart is your human spirit in this case. Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Jesus said this, all these evil things come from within. Come from where? Come from where? Without or from within? So these evil thoughts didn't come to you externally in, through this process to the soul. They had their origin here. This is how you're tempted. The enemy wants to influence you in the law of sin. He wants to train you spiritually and psychologically to be afraid. I told you that PTSD is a planned event by the villain but it is a planned event in your generations, which we want to prove today, that has been in your generations, and you have generations that you're born into that have been fearful for many generations. You can track it, just as we can track certain types of depression, bipolar, genetically inherited, recessive gene to the mother. Track it right in the X chromosome. Track it generation to generation. We get an epigenics this afternoon you're going to find that thought can be inherited. Can I prove to you how thought can be inherited? Psalm 51. King David saw a beautiful naked woman. And he should have said, what a, what a gorgeous, righteous fox, and walked away. But something within David, a thought came to him, it was lust. King David. And he saw Bathsheba, and he wanted her sexually. She was married. He's the king. He took her. She got pregnant. He got a married woman pregnant. David, David, David. Then to cover it up, he had her husband killed. Then the prophet Nathan came and busted him. David took ownership of his life. That's why he's a man after God's own heart. Do you want to be a man and a woman after God's own heart? Then take ownership of your lives and start running from your problems. Stop running from your problems. Face them. God wants to work with you. One of the great things that's happened here, you, you, you know it and you know it, is the people that come to us with all this victimization and trauma event of all different kinds, I can't take away your memory. It's yours. It's your soul. But one of the great, great powerful things that the Father is doing here in this ministry and around the world, that people now have the memory, but they no longer have the pain or the torment. 
So the memory is just a fading part of your history, but it's not part of your daily torment. Can't take away your soul, folks, but we can take away the torment. Um, in the literature, they mentioned that not being able to integrate traumatic memories seems to be linked to post-traumatic stress disorder. I, th I think why they can't be more positive about this is because they try to do all types of therapies to um, deal with these memories, but once I know for myself and I know for you, and for Pastor Henry also, is that when the Spirit of God comes in with the Word, it's a done deal if you walk in it. Well, you have to mix your faith, don't you? Now, fear is something I'll call the law of sin. Faith is the law of God. All of you have both laws in you. When you got born again, you still had the law of sin that spoke to you, didn't you? Were you still tempted by the same things that you did when you were unsaved? I want to ask you if you do the same things you do today as a Christian that you did when you were unsaved, that all the hands would go up. So I'm not going to ask you that question, but I know that everything that we did in the world, sometimes we're still doing now as Christians. I've been in this thing for 30 years. I know what's in the flock. So let's be honest. Can we just be honest? Okay. So, with, with that in mind, then the law of sin, Paul said this in Romans, in Romans 7, the apostle. He said, in my members, I have two laws. I have law of God, and I have law of sin. So, what do you do when you have two laws? The law of God is superior to the law of sin, which is inferior. So, you're pretty smart people. Do you want to follow stinking thinking, or do you want to follow superior thinking? Do you really mean that? What happens when inferior thought comes to you that contradicts God's Word? You cast down God's Word, and you follow law of sin, don't you? We do quickly because our bodies are responding with feelings and thoughts that we forget God's Word. We no longer say, for it is written to defeat the enemy. We say, oh, my God, somebody help me. Where can I find a therapist? Who's got the anointing? So you're, you're chasing your tail looking for something or someone when, in fact, God called you to take ownership of your life. You can defeat everything of your life, and God wants to work with you. Now, there are those that God has raised up to help give you education, to give you knowledge, and give you the tools to help you get your head straightened out. But you still have to mix it with your faith, don't you? That's right. That's what's wrong with uh, counseling and therapies and psychiatrists and psychologists. They, do you see all this stuff? I mean, they have all these theories. And, well, and, and like they, they practice. They practice, well, let's, let's practice on this kid and let's practice on that one and to see what works. Nothing works. You come here and you're giving pure, unadulterated word of God. It's true all the time. It doesn't make any difference what the abuse was or wasn't, or what happened or what Aunt Sally did. Or It doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is what the Word of God says right now. You know, do you think uh, uh, Peter was uh, right with God? A few of you did. Okay, good. Do you think he was born again in the, in the sense? Yeah. Jesus said to, to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan's going to manifest physically in front of you, he's going to speak to you, and he's going to convince you of something. Didn't say that, does it? This is Luke 22, 31 through 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. The Lord did nothing to stop the sifting. Why? He wanted Peter to grow up. He wanted, what? How can you grow up if somebody does everything for you? You need a mommy and daddy all your life, don't you? When I was a child, I thought as a child. 
Yeah, I needed that. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I acted and thought like a man. I didn't need mommy or daddy or somebody to help me. Now, I stumbled and I made a few mistakes, but I picked myself back up, didn't I? Did you? Though the righteous fall seven times, they shall rise again. Come on. Can we just keep moving? Why are you sitting back there where you fell in a pothole? So what? The road is filled with more than just potholes. If you make your road potholes, you're never going to be a thriver. You're going to be a survivor looking for the next pothole. That's fear-based. Are you tracking? And the Lord said to Peter, I pray for that your faith fail not. Doesn't say continue in fear. And when you are converted, now we're going to talk about something big. When I talk to people, and I said, when were you converted? They said, oh, I was born again. No, I didn't ask you that when you were born again. I said, when were you converted? A lot of people have born again, but they've not been converted in different areas of their life. Each person here is on a journey. You're a pilgrim's in progress. You come with your stuff. You have your stuff. Some things you've... Anybody defeated anything already in your life? Has anybody here defeated something with God working with you in your life? Are there things you haven't defeated? Are there things you're still stumbling around in and with? Everybody's hand goes up on that. I pray for you. I'm going to do nothing to zap you. But I pray for you that when you are converted in this area of your life, go help somebody else. Strengthen the brethren. Come on now, folks. I'm calling you to ownership. I'm calling you to action. I'm calling you to your foxholes of fear. The Bible's very clear. Leaving those things that are behind. So what if you had a trauma event? You know, PTSD talks about something in the past that's affecting you today. But you're told to leave those things that are behind, behind. I, I I've always taken great encouragement. But what I want to say to you is this. Satan spoke directly to Peter, and Peter had thoughts that did not come from his own mind. And that kingdom spoke directly to Peter and gave him thoughts that he took ownership. He denied the Lord, cursed, did his horrible things because he followed a thought that wasn't God's. You know what? Did Peter recover himself? Did Peter recover himself? Did the Lord authenticate him in his recovery? Peter, feed my sheep. Come on now, folks. We can defeat this one. Now, there's some work to be done, maybe. Now, I want to talk about long-term memory real quick. i got to move along here. There's so much stuff. In long-term memory, and this is very big in, in, in defeating PTSD, you know what PTSD stands for, don't you? Post-traumatic stress disorder. A disorder coming out of stress from the past, from a trauma event. Okay. Long-term memory, the enemy uses very skillfully. Long-term memory, as you begin to meditate, I wrote down some notes about long-term memory. Long-term memory comes out of sustained thought. You could call that meditation, not mindless, but you think about what happened that went wrong over and over and over. It comes to you. May I submit to you that that recall mechanism may be a spirit of fear that was there at the trauma event that has stayed there to, to reinforce the short-term memory to get you to recall that trauma event and that person and that thing. This is very important, folks. To get you to recall it over and over and over again because that spirit of fear knows that if it can get you to remember that trauma event over and over again, it is not just a temporary thought bouncing like a water drop on the top of a hot stove. 
But the enemy knows biology that if he can get you to think about that and he can reinforce it with this, 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 and this over and over again, that through an aspect of creation, through the working what's called protein synthesis, that's hard to say, you know, when you're in a hurry. Protein synthesis, that's a hard word, you know. Protein synthesis, and now it uses an element of RNA and DNA. We're going to talk about epigenics with RNA. There is over and over again that that thought becomes permanently part of your long-term memory. The enemy will train you to be phobic. The enemy will train you to be fearful. You might even say, I'm a fearful person. No, you're a person that has practiced fear too long. Well, I need a, I need a present. No, you need one pill. The gospel pill. That God has not given you the spirit of fear. So where did it come from? It didn't come from God? So that thought becomes permanently part of your biology. Say, biology. Well, your mind is renewed how? By the washing of the water of the word. So now you have fear. Now you, God is not giving the spirit of fear. You got to meditate on that. Now you have both laws in your memory. In your memory, you've tucked away the word of God. The law of sin certainly is there. And now, when fear comes, or the feelings and the emotions come, you have the word of God right there that the Holy Spirit can energize from here and from here so that as the spirit of fear is speaking to you, the spirit of God is reminding you of God's word so that the word of God is superior to the inferiority of the law of sin. You cast down one, you embrace the other, and what you're about to do is train yourself out of fear. I have an example of that. Go ahead. Uh, the enemy trained me to be really afraid of bugs. I mean really afraid of bugs because of an event that had to Wait do Wait a minute. With, yes. Part of my humor is I bug you. I know all the time. <laughs> but I don't swat him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was I always it wasn't just afraid of bugs. You don't know how many services or how many conversations or how many because I saw a bug because that, re that triggered something in my brain that made me so afraid that it would make me completely check out. Well, I come down here and I learn about God has not granted the spirit of fear. I mean, <laughs> God does not grant it. And, and one day in the service, it was a couple months ago, it could have been last week if I, it wasn't, it was a couple months ago, I saw a bug on the stage. It was, oh, there's a lot of people here. And I completely did not see anybody. I didn't see, I saw that bug and I'm in my head. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm, I'm staying, I'm staying. And I got up out of my chair in front of God and everybody in the middle of a service and squashed that bug. Remember Pastor Donna? <laughs> and, and I went, yeah, because I wasn't gonna check out. I would miss a service over a bug. I would miss a conversation over a bug. A little, you know, spider floating through the air. I think bugs are in trouble with you now. You're going to squish they them. They are, and I squish them hard. I squish them really, really hard. We could, we could say, could I introduce to you Lavinda, Mrs. Riddabug. You know, I just want to get you a, a picture because I want you to have tools to overcome. You, can, you don't have to hang on to the failures of your thought, nor do you need to allow it to control you. If I revisited all my failure thoughts from the past, I wouldn't be here today. I'm here today because I only meditate on the good things of God, and I dismiss everything else that's a counterfeit. But if you don't have the Word of God, you're easy pickings. If you don't cannot say, for it is written when the enemy speaks to you, your easy pickings. I learned how to defeat the enemy from the Lord himself. He just said, for it is written. But I said, I don't know a line of verse. The Lord didn't use line of verse either. 
I said, Lord did not use line or verse. He just said, for it is written. Wouldn't that be good enough to say? Well, it is written. Where is it? Who cares? It is written. Also, I found a lot in the literature that if you have one stress or trauma almost on a continuum and I know biblically we can walk through those traumas and not let them add up and that's part of your walk out you have one trauma fear is fear so we've all overcome by dismissing things that are not of God haven't we we, you, you guys wouldn't have had the freedom you have today if you hadn't been able to change your spirituality and your personality. How many would like to have a personality change? All your friends say it's time. <laughs> my wife helps me understand the parts of my personality that aren't good for us. On her end, I just pray for her. That's wisdom. I'm away from that much fun. I wanted Almost to. Almost lunchtime. It, oh, <laughs> we're fasting lunch today. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me run down through some charts real fast. Um, take me to chart C1, whatever that is. Is that it right there? Give me the next one, right down the list. See if I like it or not. Oh, that's not it. Oh, we did that one already. What's the next one? I just wanted to show you something, what fear does versus love. The first part, and we're going to take this into our journey today in, in physiology. We're going to get into some biology and physiology and psychology and all that stuff for those that are interested. But right here, fear affects the body through the ectoderm. The ectoderm is part of your initial uh, formation of your body. You had the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. But look up here is your brain and nervous system. The first thing that fear affects is topside. Doesn't affect your to doesn't affect your liver or your intestines. The enemy wants to control you where? He wants to control you as a spirit being and he wants to control you as a thinking psychological being. And the first part that fear does, it removes, your, it removes your ability to have love because fear came because you didn't feel loved. I submit to you that PTSD is the result of a love disorder. Generationally and positionally and family trees. We want to prove that to you. You're trained to be afraid. You're trained to be traumatized. In fact, the enemy sets you up to be victims. And no one has told your family trees that you've been used at this level because you followed thoughts because it seems so real at the moment because most people control other people in fear. The bully is more afraid than you. And many people control other people with fear tactics to traumatize them and control them because they're so full of fear themselves. So it's right here it happens. Next chart. The fear will separate you from God. You'll have sadness. You'll have conflict. You feel unloved. All this stuff. Then you have to compensate by creating your own personality of protection. That's idolatry. And so you begin to form yourself in your image. But that image you're being formed in isn't your image. The enemy is forming your personality in his image. Come on, folks. Don't be so easy anymore. Don't let your thoughts control you at this level. What's the next chart? Now, this is just coming out of the GAS, uh, General Adaptation Syndrome. Over here is the what fight or flight. That would be a, a stressor, a trauma event, fight or flight. Right here is part of the uh, paranoid schizophrenia profile. 
the over-secretion of norepinephrine and all this other stuff. Keep moving. Oh, I want to stay, stay, back, back up. Right here you see how stress affects the hypothalamus. Mark that down, hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the bridge between the brain and the endocrine system. It's the bridge between thought and physiology. Also, part of this, of course, is your central nervous system. Your enemy, through thought, can control your entire physiology, your entire homeostasis, because you'd rather believe a lie than believe the truth. Come on now, folks. Now work, work with me. You say, but this is just too much work. You're worth it. Would you like to continue on, fearful, victimized, fearful? Or would you like, do you want to go back to where you came from? Do you want to go back to where you came from? I don't want you to either. I don't want to go back to where I came from. If you want me to go back to where I came from, my wife will chase you out of the building. And she should. And God's right behind her. What's the next chart? The limbic system. I want to talk about the limbic system briefly before the lunch. Because it's key to PTSD. Uh, first of all, you have the limbic lobe, the hippocampus, the amygdala, the amygdala, amygdaloid nucleus. Yeah, we don't call it that. We just call it the amygdala. Forget about all that nonsense. The hypothalamus and, and, and the thalamus. Now, those are little glands up here somewhere just in back in, in this area that actually... Do this. The limbic system controls behavioral responses, biological rhythms, feeding behaviors. It is the primary function is the consolidation of memory through a reviberating circuit that processes your thought. This happens before it settles in here. This is a journey from outside, inside influence to get eventually up here. But it goes through this system of processing. And the enemy knows how to mess up the processing center. It is also the primary center for expression of the emotional and behavioral status. The amygdala. We're going to spend a lot of time this afternoon. The primary role in the formation and storage of memories associated with emotional events. The cortex, the thinking brain, stores those memories that are processed by the amygdala. So if I wanted to control your mind, I'm going to have to interrupt the process of thought before it gets to your mind. So that what you have in your mind that becomes part of your long-term memory isn't going to be right. I'm going to train you to be a fearful person but I'm going to work with you through circumstances so that when these thoughts are all jumbled up and coming out of the stressors and the trauma event, when it gets here, you're, you're tormented. I'm going to guarantee that I can make you tormented. Or can you do something to stop that mess? 2 Corinthians 10.5 says you can. Hold every thought captive. Quit running. And listen to this. It helps in memory consolidation until that memory reaches a relatively permanent state. That's long-term memory where your storage unit is here. This is your thinking brain. The limbic system is the processing part of your brain. It assimilates all these stimuluses you have, external, internal. It's like a massive computer, but it's all biologic. The thalamus. I liked what they said in the, in the research. It's the air traffic controller. Processes the journey from sensation to action. Keeps the signals moving. Typical, directs the impulse to the cortex, the thinking brain. The cortex thinks about the impulse and makes sense out of the event. Fear will not let you make sense out of the event. Jesus didn't have PTSD because he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He knew why, what had happened to him, he was prepared for it, he wasn't stressed out about it, 
He counted it all joy, as Paul said, I counted it all joy because he understood the nature of the warfare. Most humans aren't prepared for this kind of victory. You're just the tail that's being wagged. Well, it's time for you to wag the enemy. This creates then emotion and action. However, in the event of a stress or a threat, listen to this carefully. I want to finish this before lunch. I'll give you 10 minutes on the other end. In the event of a threat or a stress event, the thalamus hijacks the amygdala. It bypasses the cortex, the long-term memory thinking brain, your personality, and the signals go directly to the amygdala, and this part never is involved. You're no holding every thought captive there. The hippocampus is a center of emotion, memory, and the autonomic nervous system. That's why a woman doesn't feel loved by her husband, not nurtured, doesn't feel at peace here, comes around her, she's the problem, she's always the problem, she's not the gift she's supposed to be, she's the ir issue for his irritation. So he's generating fear into her life. Then all of a sudden, coming down through the limbic system, all this stuff is happening. She's not thinking here because she's being controlled by her emotions and the fears and the stress of the husband that is not loving her. The signal goes directly through the hypothalamus into the thyroid, and the thyroid doesn't produce enough thyroxine. It underproduces thyroxine, and you have hypothyroidism, which is not a disease, it's a syndrome. Every disease and disorder in the human body is in these type of pathways. So rather than chasing the symptoms of a disease, why don't we go upstream and begin, first of all, to understand cause and effect? How the enemy is doing it, what body parts he's using, that we can begin to allow God to work with us. He's the creator. You cannot expect to have, the, have peace in creation if you don't have peace with the Creator. And you can't expect to have peace in creation if you don't have peace with yourself as part of creation. And you're not going to have peace with yourself if you don't have peace with others who are all part of the organism. we got some work to do, don't we? All of this can be defeated. You had a journey for your victory. You have a journey and had a journey for your victory. I have a journey for my victory. When are you going to start taking your journey? I hope this conference will allow you to start taking the journey because I want the hypothalamus to serve you. The hypothalamus is the bridge from the mind to the body, the connection. It links the nervous system to the endocrine system via the pituitary gland. It controls everything in somatic expression, everything in homeostasis right down to levels of arousal or wakefulness, pleasure, punishment, sexual, temperature, sympathetic, parasympathetic activity, hormone synthesis, everything in the physiology, this one gland controls the piece of it. And this is the one gland the enemy knows he can control your bodies if he can control your spirituality and your souls. 80% of all disease is a planned event by the villain. Wake up. Science will never defeat the villain. They'll just make the villain laugh because they're chasing symptoms. Forget about cure. And the thing that's missing in all of science is disease prevention. Oh, yes, nutrition and exercise. Nutrition and exercise hasn't put a dent in syndromes and incurable diseases. But your joints are screaming from running. How much money are you spending on nutrition? And how much time are you spending on righteousness? And adding the law of God to your members and getting rid of the law of sin. When are we going to begin to create safe places of residences 
safe marriages, safe churches, safe families, safe cities, safe nation. Without God, it's never going to happen, folks, because humans don't understand their own minds, that they're nothing more than a puppet on a string. Dum, 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 dum. Any more comments? Not at this time, except that um, perfect peace belongs to those whose minds are stayed on the Lord. I say it's time to take back our hypothalamus. Hey everyone, it's Pastor Scott again. I hope this conference is beginning to open your eyes to exactly how our enemy wants to rob us of our love and relationships through PTSD. But I can tell you what, he doesn't have to win. Many others before you have proved God's faithfulness in defeating PTSD, including myself. Now maybe you're taking massive amount of notes. I know I did when this first happened and are wondering how can I get all this information? How do I hold it all in? How do I get it? Or maybe you're thinking, I got this guy. I know this person I love and I want them to hear this. Well, if that's you, I have some really great news for you. The complete teaching you are watching right now is available in CD format. This is an excellent item to purchase to share this message with others or for your own review. Now, usually this CD that I'm holding retails for about $36.99. But today only, you can purchase it along with all of our other BN Health resources for 20% off until midnight tonight. I do want to read a really cool quote on the back of this. It says, all healing from PTSD begins when feeling safe again by Dr. Henry Wright. It's a great line. Now earlier, you saw a video highlighting our four my life retreat here in Thomaston, Georgia. It is an amazing week and really truly is life changing. We understand that not everybody can make it here to Georgia. And that's why we created the for my life online retreat. If you cannot make it here in person to come see us, hang out with us and experience For My Life here, the online is the next best option. And at our For My Life retreat, you will learn biblical principles and tools that will help you get free and stay free. And there are thousands of testimonies of healing from all manner of disease as a result of the biblical information that is presented and with the Holy Spirit working with everyone involved, for My Life takes one week to complete in person. You come here, one week out of your life here. But online, we give you up to three months to complete this course. That way you can work it in with your own schedule and what you have going on in your life. Today only, we wanna offer it to you for $100 off. Just click the link below to register and we'll get you set up. Now, we're halfway through. We've already done two sessions so far today. We've got two more coming up and they're getting just awesome. I love watching this conference. With that, I hope you enjoy this little break and we'll be back in a couple hours for the next two sessions. God bless, we'll see you soon. Having the For My Life program online has been kind of a dream of ours because, you know, not everybody can come here at this time or any time. Maybe, maybe you're too sick or, or maybe just your life circumstances won't allow you to do that. I don't want you to think you're, feel, you're being cheated because you're not able to come here. God will meet you in a most amazing way. But the For My Life online to me is a very intimate time with the Lord. What I mean by that is, you know, some of my greatest breakthroughs with God have been in my prayer closet, or it's been I've heard something or I've read something in the scripture, and I didn't have the distractions of anyone around me to be able to thwart maybe what God was wanting to do in my life. It's also a time for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you things of your past that brought you to the present, and, and, and he, that he can be able to speak to you and convict you and show you things that maybe you've never seen before. Because I know that when you hear these teachings, you are going to hear things that, yes, you may have read so many times or maybe never, 
but they're the, but, but God's going to ignite something in the times that you hear this and you are going to be able to just totally surrender to him vulnerability and also humility also too because you're reflecting on the past that brought you to the present we also give you hope for the future the thing is is that before god he begins to ignite things in that be still and know that i am god moment where he shows you oh my goodness i have tools to overcome forever and ever for as long as i'm here on this earth i can overcome so i really hope that you consider taking the for my life online not for us but for you